come to the Father's house. Let's stand to our feet, put our hands together. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. Let's sing to him like we've never sung before. Let's put our hands together.
are going to come forward. Today we're going to celebrate communion together. We practice open communion here at the Father's house, which simply means that if you have Jesus living in your heart, if you're a Christ follower, we would invite you to participate in communion with us today. Ushers, you can go ahead and pass the elements out. So last Monday in California, three people shot and killed at a festival. This past Tuesday in Mississippi, two people shot and killed in a Walmart. Saturday in Texas, 20 people shot and killed, 26 injured in a Walmart. Early this morning, about 1.30 in Ohio, nine people shot and killed, 26 injured in a downtown area. So today, as we take communion, we're gonna remember families, victims, first responders, and follow-up personnel. Communion has often been called the meal that heals. And so today, as we take communion, we are going to remember that Christ died on the cross for our sins, for the sins of the world. He died on the cross so that we could have healing. When he was on the cross, he said, it's finished. Everything was finished, our healing. Everything that this world needs was a finished work at the cross. So today, as we take our elements, we're going to hold and wait for everyone to be served. But I just want you right now, just in your own heart, just to begin to offer up a prayer. Begin to remember those families that have been affected by this, the communities that have been affected by this. The Bible says on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he said, take eat because this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he took the cup, the New Testament, the gospel of his blood that would go on to be shed for mankind. Let's take the cup together.
Father, today our country mourns and there are questions running through minds of why am I safe? What's going on? Why is all this happening? Father, today we ask that we would be able to release this to your spirit. Father, right now we pray for families of victims. We pray for those that are injured, those, Father God, that are recovering from injuries right now, fighting for their lives. We pray for their families. We pray for first responders, Father. We pray for the, the follow-up counselors that will be there. We pray for communities. Father, we pray that the communities would come together, that this United States would come together and know that Jesus Christ is the way. Father, we pray that in the midst of tragedy, that your light would shine, that the faith community would step up and be able to present the gospel and the hope of Jesus Christ for a hurting world. So, Father, right now, we just ask for peace to settle upon these communities and hope and healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. I'm going to ask you to do something different. I'm going to ask you to sing for those families that Pastor Tim talked about. Let's not sing for ourselves this morning, but let's prophesy over these families that there's no shadow that he won't light up. There's nothing that is overshadowing them that he can't light up. They're not too far from him and he can't reach out and take hold of them to lift them up in their time of need. So let's do that this morning as a community. There's no shadow won't climb up coming at you. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. Come on, sing over those families. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't coming after me come on raise your voice a little bit no shadow there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me who knows what our worship can do in this moment there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me sing no shadow there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up Raise your hands this morning. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. You're coming after me. We surrender it. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. You're coming after me. Holy, overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, Couldn't earn it 
love covers over a multitude of sins. me how about you amen well before you take a seat this morning would you turn to a few of your neighbors and would you welcome them to the father's house tell them hey you look great this morning glad you came glad we're sitting next to each other you're my neighbor today are coming down the aisles now and they would love to serve you so if you didn't get one of the Sunday experience guides just raise up your hand and they will be happy to give you one of those make sure that you get that you want that every single Sunday because there's important information in there there is um, your notes for the, for today so that you can take notes um, for what God has to say to you if today is your first day with us we are so excited so thankful and honored that you came here to the father's house um, if you could do me a favor and reach in the seat back in front of you and pull out a connection card we all do that especially this series because we all have well not all of us the staff doesn't but the rest of you you get to have a chance well we could go actually if you won and you took one of us so that would be awesome so just think about that if you win I'm just kidding but you have you have a, an awesome chance to win dinner and a movie um, how awesome is that but you have to fill out your entire connection card you have to fill out your name your date of birth your email address if you have one your address all of that good stuff and turn that in at the end when the when the offering uh, bucket passes by you, you want to make sure that you put that in there so that you have a chance to win tomorrow morning when we pick out of the pile to see who wins we hope that you do that but for our first time people today we especially hope that you fill that out with as much information as you feel comfortable with because we want to invite you to something that we call here at the father's house the house party the house party is a really good, this section over here has been to the house party and they thought it was really fun. The house party is an awesome time. It's a great time, lots of fun that you get to come uh, to the house and you get to eat some nachos. We feed you, so we, we need to make sure that we know that you're coming so that we have enough for that. So if you'll uh, put on your connection card on the back, sign me up for the house party if you have never been. It's a great way that you get to talk with and meet the pastors and the staff and maybe some key leaders and also some new people that are just like you. Um, it's it's hard to come into a place and you don't know anybody. So this is an opportunity that we um, have are giving you that you can meet some new people so that when you come back in um, after the house party that you can see some familiar faces and know some know some names and you have met some people so that you don't feel like the newbie here. Um, one more thing that I want to talk about, and that is uh, in your Sunday experience guide, there is, I've talked for the last few weeks, but I want to make sure in case you didn't, um, you weren't here or you didn't know, but um, August uh, first Wednesday is this coming uh, Wednesday. In your guide, it actually says the third, so we would have had it yesterday, but we really didn't. It's um, it's this this uh, Wednesday at seven o'clock. We hope that you come out because we have a guest speaker. Her name is Sippy Segal, and she is coming all the way from Jerusalem to come and to talk with us on Wednesday night about um, the roots of our faith. And she's going to talk about some discoveries um, that have. And and when we were in Israel, man, that some of that stuff blew my mind of the things that they have discovered they have unearthed and you will not want to miss because it is going to be a great 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 time you guys doing okay this morning all right well let's get ready to hear the word and let's watch this first
growth track is a four-step process that happens on the first, second, third, and fourth Sunday of every month to help you connect with the church and make a difference with your life. Join us on Sundays at 11 a.m. in the growth track room in the main building. You don't have to sign up. Just show up to find out how you can make a difference. I'm a, I'm a great example of what it looks like to lose something massive, but then to get it back. But even when I got my family back, I still didn't, I still wasn't all the way fixed with my issues. The goal is not to fix the marriage. You need to fix your heart. Freedom is not found in striving. Freedom is found in surrender. When you kill your spider, that breath is how you're gonna know because you're gonna be able to breathe the breath that you've not breathed in so long. Good morning, Father's house. Oh, I like that. That was good. Turn around and kind of look at one of the cameras back there and say, have a good time, Pastor Terry. We'll miss you for the next four months. No, he will be back next week. He will be back next week. We just want to welcome all of you and those of you who are joining us on the internet. Welcome to the house. Good to have you here this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben Randall. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. I'm also on the board of directors, and I pitch popcorn and Cracker Jacks on Sunday morning in the back. And today, I get to share with you part of our series. Actually, this is the conclusion of our series at the movies, and it's where we take a film, a uh, recently uh, released film, that is, allows us the opportunity to uh, draw from that some spiritual insight and share with you a message. Now, we're not endorsing any particular film. We're just simply using them as inspiration. Uh, before I do that, however, we're going to kind of change things around just a little bit this morning. <clears throat> normally, normally, we receive our tithes and offerings at the conclusion of the service. I would like to do that now. I'd like to receive them up front. And there's going to be a reason for it, which you'll understand at the end of the service. But yesterday... Uh, my wife and I went shopping. Uh, well, let's just put it this way. My wife went shopping, <coughs> and, and I drove her there and sat in the car a long time. But it's okay. I feel better now that the air conditioning's on in the house here. But we walked into one of the stores, and I noticed as we walked into this retail store, all the lights were on, the air conditioning. It was a hot day, so it really felt good. You know that feeling when you first walk into one of those stores from a hot day? It's just like, oh. It just felt great, and everything was well lit and well placed. All their products were out, and, and as I was walking down and I was looking at all this stuff that um, could be purchased by someone, I, uh, oh, by the way, it's her birthday. I had to buy something, you know. <laughs> Happy birthday, Roberta. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, as I was looking at all this stuff, I, I, I picked something. I don't remember what it was, but I picked it up, and I looked at the price tag, and it was on sale, had 30% off. And I thought, well, wow, that's quite a deal. I bet you even at 30%, maybe even 50%, I wasn't going to be paying near what it cost to actually create that object that I held in my hand. You see, there, there's a cost to it, but they don't sell it at that cost. They sell it at that cost plus a markup, right? And they do that so that they can turn on those lights and turn on that air conditioning and make sure everything's out there so that I can see it and want to buy it. And, I, and I, as I was standing here, I thought, you know, that, that's kind of like the church. We have lights and air conditioning and hopefully comfortable seats for you. And, and, and we do that so that you can come in and receive the word without distraction. Because there's nothing worse than coming in to listen to someone talk to you and you're distracted because it's too hot or you can't see or you can't hear. You know, right? We're just, like, we're just like that retail store with a couple of exceptions. For one thing, we don't have a markup. In fact, 
we don't sell you anything. It's free. And what you get from us isn't going to wear out or break or fall apart. It's going to last forever. Now, the difference also is they make a product that they can sell to keep the lights on. Our lights are kept on because you choose to provide the resources to do just that. And God gave us a mandate of how that could be done through tithes and offerings. It's not a matter of conviction. It's just a simple matter of economics. And God said he had a way to keep his house viable. Do you realize that if every profession, ev professing evangelical Christian were to actually tithe the changes we could have made for Christ in this world? Well, maybe someday we all will. But today, you have an opportunity. So I'm going to ask you if you would, let, let's pray our prayer. And this is a prayer that it's a statement as much as a prayer in regard to our offerings. Lord, come on. As an expression of our love and obedience to you. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us. You are the divine. Thank you. Help us. Amen. Andrew, did you see that? I just lit a choir. <laughs> Praise God. Gentlemen, would you come, folks? And while we're doing that, watch this and get a little title to my message. So in your notes, if you want to write down what the title of this is, the title is To Value Life. Now, this is a, a message that, quite honestly, well, let me, let me just back up and tell you. The film that I had drew my message from was a film called On Planned. Did anybody see that? A few of you? It's a true story, actually, about a young lady by the name of Abby Johnson, who was the youngest appointed director for Planned Parenthood. And it's the story about the transition that she makes between being a counselor and director at Planned Parenthood to becoming a pro-life activist. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When I sat at the film, I, I watched it alone. My wife was working, so I had an afternoon off. I went to the movie, and, and I watched it. Pastor Anita had uh, told me about the movie. <clears throat> and at the very end of it, you know, hey, you can sit there and watch the, the credits as they go by. I was, I just really wasn't interested in the credits, but I was just simply watching them as they went by, and, and I was thinking to myself, I had close to two months, because Pastor had asked me to do this over two months ago. I thought, I got two months, I can find another film. I really can. I mean, I, it was a good movie, don't get me wrong. I, it just wasn't the direction I was really feeling excited to go to, and so I thought, well, I'll, I'll go somewhere else. 
And then I walked out of the theater, and as I walked out onto the sidewalk right in front of the theater in broad daylight, I suddenly had what you would call an epiphany. Everything that was being discussed in the film kind of started racing through my mind, and it was being commingled with my own life. <laughs> and I stood there, probably looking rather stupid, drool coming down, just, you know. Have you ever had one of those moments? Just, it, I had one of those moments, and, and I stood there, and I had a sudden deep gratitude for the life that God has given me. Sometimes we just take our everyday free and we don't realize how valuable our life is. The fact that we're still sucking air is an amazing gift. Let me, let me give you a little background. And I don't do this. Please understand. I don't do this for emotion. I don't want emotion. I want you to use your head today. Emotions come and go. They're, they're fleeting very quickly. And a lot of people move on emotion, and then when they're not emotionally involved or something else grabs a hold of their heart, then they're off track. I want you here and, and here and with your head and your ears and your heart. My, my mother uh, had three children before me. She had a little girl and two boys. Her husband was uh, in the military. He had been sent to Europe to fight in World War II. While he was gone, she got up one morning, dressed her children, and walked her little girl and little boys over to a friend's house and dropped them off and said, I never want to see or speak to them again. And she abandoned them and never did speak to them until they were adults. Now, when I was conceived, she and my father were not married. And that was a time back when, when this was frowned upon. You didn't make movies out of it or celebrate celebrities with it. It was not appreciated. Oh, I should correct that. She was married. They were married. It just they weren't married to each other. My father had a family of his own and children of his own, and so did she that she had abandoned. Now, when I was about three weeks old, she dropped me off at a friend's house because she was going to the movies, and it was a double feature. They didn't come back for years. Now, I'm saying that for this one thing. Now you can kind of get a small idea of how my felt standing on that sidewalk. I suddenly realized, do you realize if I had been conceived just a, a decade or two later, I would not be standing here in front of you. I can be sure of that. But I was standing in front of that theater, and as I stood there, people, <laughs> if you've ever had one of those moments, you kind of go into this emotional vacuum, you know, Everything around you is gone for just a moment. And I suddenly realized that there were people walking around me because I'm standing right in front of the door of the theater. <laughs> you know? and, and, and I kind of turned to look at them, and of course they were looking at me. What's the matter with him? And the Lord spoke to my heart at that moment and said, now you see your value. You affect the forward motion of other people. You see, they had a destination. They had a place to go. They had a path they were going to take. And I was in the way. And if I hadn't been born, they'd have just gone right on through, but they had to actually take a detour. You see, the value of my life is not a value incentrically within me. It's a value because of you. I have value because you have value. Does that make sense? And you have value. You know why? Look around you. That's why you have value. Because every day you have an opportunity to make a difference in somebody's life, even if it's a small one. Even if it's, even if it's just standing between them and the door. You can change the path of somebody's direction, and hopefully in the right direction. And until you start valuing your life, you cannot love your neighbor as you love yourself. So you've got to value your life. Because your life is a gift from Almighty God. I went home and I, I, I told my wife, I said, you know, I, I saw this film and I know what Lord wants me to speak about. And that's, I'm going to talk to you about the value of your life. I'm not going to deal with the issue of abortion. I, I don't want to go there. But I'm going to talk to you about your life. 
my wife with the wisdom of Solomon that she has given and the bite of a small rattler. She comes walking off, and she, she walks in the kitchen. She just very kindly says, that's an easy way out. She was right. It would have been an easy way out. We have an issue in our lives today where life is not valued. What you read this morning, Pastor Tim, clearly defines where we're going in this world. Life doesn't have value. And if it doesn't have value with those who can walk, talk, buy, and interfere with your life, then how much less does it have with those lives that have yet even that opportunity? And I think we need to talk about that. So I'm going to talk about it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Pastor Anita used this as an opening verse for last week. I want to as well. It says, for we are God's handiwork. Isn't that great? Turn around look at somebody and say, you are handiwork. Now, I saw, I, I could see it. I could feel it in the room. Somebody went, boy, are you handiwork. No, I mean, say it nicely. Gee. <laughs> For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance to do. Did you get that advance? That's not an advance of the work. He didn't create some ideas of things he wanted you to do just before you had to do them. No, it's an advance of you. He created what he would have you do before there was a you to do it. He had what he wanted you to do in his heart before there was a you because he had you before there was a you. And he never had a you. He always wanted you, and there you are. I mean, let's face it, God stopped for a moment and said, hmm, I don't, I don't have a Pastor Tim. Boop, got me one now. <laughs> the choice, however, is ours. The issue that we're talking about here has divided our nation. It divides family, it divides friends, it divides us politically, religiously, morally, ethically, personally, it has divided us, and I assure you it will also have a very major impact in who will run our country. We have to really think about this issue. We cannot ignore it. And since I'm a pastor that you won't often see up here, I can take the heat this time because I'm going to talk about it. Okay? 48%, and according to Gallup poll in May of 2018, 48% of Americans are pro-choice and 48% are pro-life. We are split right down the middle. But how does God, what does God think of life and choice? Look at Genesis chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and listen to what this says. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Get that? Now think about this. God created man and then breathed into him life. If you read Genesis, you'll see that God created man, put him in the garden for the purposes of taking care of the garden. He was a caretaker. What God could have done is done what we did. We have this little uh, eye robot vacuum cleaner. You know that little round thing? And it, it sits up against the wall, and it, we call it Mabel. And Mabel, at 1 o'clock, hey, everybody's got a Mabel. Mabel, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, will pull away from the wall, run through the house, cleaning up all the floors, scaring the dog, and getting stuck underneath the sofa every day. But well, then you pull her out, and off she goes. She goes on back and plugs herself into the wall just to wait until tomorrow. See, somebody created Mabel, just like God created man, to do a job. And she does the job well. She doesn't ask for days off or benefits or raise or nothing. She just goes to work. But God went one step further. He took what he created, and he breathed into it the personage of life. Life. He didn't have to, but he did. Now, look at, look at verses. So he's pro-life, by the way. He is pro-life because he created it. <laughs> Pretty good. Genesis, look at uh, Genesis 2, verses 8 and 9. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east of Eden, and there he put the man that he had formed. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. By the way, that's kind of a misnomer. Adam already knew. Adam and Eve knew good because they knew God, and you don't get any better good than that. What they didn't know was the dark side, the evil, the, what to choose from. Why didn't God do what any decent parent in this room would probably do, what we did with our kids? If we had something we didn't want him fooling with, we put it either out of reach or out of sight. He could have put that tree anywhere. But he puts it right in the middle 
of the garden. And he did that because that requires man to walk by these decisions and make a choice every single day of their life. They have to make a choice. And the first thing they did before they went wrong is make a choice. You see, God created us and made us the free gift as a free moral agent. We have the right to make choices, even bad ones. God's pro-choice, too. How about that? He just wants us to make the right ones. He is pro-life. He is pro-choice. There's some, there's some credible, very credible, credible arguments about the issue of abortion. There really are. You can't, you can't just simply bury your head and say, oh, I don't believe in that. I, I'm not accepting that. I mean, there's the health of the mother. There's the health of the child. There's the circumstances around that, that brought about the pregnancy. There are serious things that you cannot simply ignore. But here's the one problem with that. One thing that we all can do is that is the issues we deal with, and that's where we leave it. There's one question that must always, always, always be asked. And this is a question that, quite honestly, ladies and gentlemen, if you leave this place with nothing, go home with this. Write it in your notes, burn it in your brain, and know that you have to ask this question anytime you deal with any issue or anyone in regard to this particular thing of life. And that is this when it comes to abortion. Is it merely tissue to be removed, or is it a life that will be taken? I want you to read that out loud with me. I want your ears to hear from your lips what this says. Ready? Go. It is merely. That's the question you have to ask. Because you can't make a decision about what you're going to do until you determine whether or not it's a life or tissue. Right? Because if, that, if the unborn is not the life of a person, then it doesn't have the right for protection or life as any other human being would because it's your tonsils. You take your tonsils out, you don't take them home and hope they survive. It's just tissue. But if it's a, actually a human being from the moment of conception all the way through to birth, if it is in fact a human being, then the question is, do we have the right to take its life? Or are we responsible to protect it? The first question is, is it life? The second question is, is it valuable enough to exist? Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, brings this question up thousands of years ago. Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses, and now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Let me ask you, how many here would say with some reasonable confidence that Christianity generally has always pretty much been opposed to abortion? I mean, really? Yeah, all around the room. A lot of you aren't going to ask, raise your hand because you go, I'm not going to be wrong. Well, you know, I've always thought that. Christ Christians have always been opposed to it. I want you to know that what we know in medical science today is not what we knew 50 years ago. It is not. And you may, some of you in the room think, 50 years, man, that's almost back in Moses' day. No, no, me and Mo didn't, I didn't hang out with Mo, but, but it wasn't, trust me, 50 years isn't as far back as you might think. Listen to what this says. <clears throat> this is from the Southern Baptist Convention. The Southern Baptist Convention, by the way, is probably one of the largest single Protestant uh, gatherings of Christians in the country, and they are very politically motivated. In 1971, the Southern Baptist Convention agreed in a joint resolution, quote, we call upon Southern Baptists to work for legislation that will allow the possibility of abortion, period. Ooh. Christianity Today. Anybody ever see the magazine? Still on the shelves. Christianity Today and the Christian Medical Society, quote, whether the performance of an induced abortion is sinful we are not agreed, but about the necessity of it and the permissibility for it under certain circumstances, we are in one accord. Wow. Dallas Theological Seminary, probably the 
one of the largest seminaries that produced pastors and teachers of the gospel throughout the world. Professor Bruce Wachey, Dallas Theological Seminary. God does not regard the fetus as a soul, no matter how far gestation has progressed. Really? Professor Norman Geisler. The embryo is not fully human. It is an undeveloped person. Wow. Fifty years ago, what we knew scientifically was combined in with our knowledge of what we knew biblically. And in my personal opinion, I think these gentlemen put this down and picked up a book of medical science at the time. But they were sharing what they believed at the time. The foundation of Christianity didn't have a problem in, its, in the leadership roles of, of abortion until somewhere along the line something changed. On January 22nd, 1973, the United States Supreme Court, with the information that basically said it was tissue, not life, laid down its landmark decision of Roe versus Wade making abortion legal. Why is it everybody's so concerned today that are pro-choice that we may end up losing that right if it goes back to the Supreme Court? If it's an issue of constitutional right, the Constitution hasn't changed. So what in the world could possibly have changed that would make them actually reverse it? Well, it's the, it's the, it's the judges. No, it's not. The Constitution is still the Constitution. You can't change it. What's changed is that now we're not going to go back to the court about the issue of a choice to remove a tissue. We're going back to determine if we can take a life. And that life has the same constitutional rights as everybody else. Now we got a problem. Do you see what I'm saying? Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 says, For the Lord grants wisdom, and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. And he grants, get this, he grants a treasure of what? Common sense. To whom? The honest. And what does he mean by the honest? The honest is, first off, we all know what common sense is, but what does he mean by the honest? The honest is someone who is willing to go out and study God's word to find out the truth because it's the truth that will set us free. Not study the word to make sure that what you believe is going to be accepted and approved. I want you to go home from this message and I want you to study anything and everything that I have said to you and go even deeper and further and prove me wrong. Because if you can actually look to find me wrong, you're going to find the truth. And the truth will set you free. And it's going to save a lot of lives. You should do that every Sunday morning. You should take pastor's message. Pastor, <laughs> we're still friends, right? You should take pastor's message. Take it home. Dissect it, break it down, and study it. And make sure, because you would never go to a restaurant and order off the menu the food that had already been eaten. Then why would you do that here? Am I, am I making my point? Just, just give me an uh-huh. Very good. That's what I like to hear. Times have changed. Biology hasn't changed. We've just gotten to know it better. At the moment of conception, 23 chromosomes from dad and 23 chromosomes from mom come together and give us a 46-chromosome single-cell embryo whose entire nature has been presupposed and established at that very moment we know it. At that moment, not, not 10 weeks, 10, 20 weeks, 30 weeks down the road. At that moment, the characteristics of that child has been formed. In 8 to 13 weeks, gender is apparent. Eyes are open. Little fingers and toes are there. Fingerprints for the rest of their life, and they can also feel pain. In, eight to th in 16 to 20 weeks, this little influencer of life is now a whopping 8 to 12 inches tall. And with proper neonatal care, can, has a good chance of surviving. We have broken it down to weeks. Well, there's so many weeks and so many weeks and so many weeks. Really? Let me ask you a question. What does modern medical science say about this issue? And I'm not talking about modern medical Christian science. I'm talking about just simple medical science today. What does it say today that it didn't say 50 years ago? 
When I got into this, and I've been doing this now for the last couple of months, I have so much information in my head, I'm not kidding you, I feel like I'm going to pop. That's why you're here for a four-hour message. Get, hold, get ready. <laughs> and by the way, Andrea, thank you so much for the time you've given me this morning. Listen to this. Dr. M.M. M. Matthew, Harvard Medical School. These are secular medical scientists. They are not Christian. M. M. Dr. M.M. M. Matthew, Harvard Medical. In biology and in medicine, it is an accepted fact that the life of any individual organism resulting from sexual reproduction begins at conception or fertilization, unquote. Dr. Jeremy Lejeune, University of Medicine, Paris, France, quote, to accept the fact that after fertilization has taken place, a new human being has come into being is no longer a matter of taste or opinion. The human nature of the human being from conception to old age is not a metaphysical contention. It is plain experimental evidence, unquote. Dr. Jaime Gordon, University of California School of Medicine, quote, but now we can say unequivocally that the question of when life begins is no longer a question for theological or philosophical dispute. It is an established scientific fact. Theologians, pastors, and philosophers may go on to debate the meaning of life or the purpose of life, but it, can, but it is an established fact that all life, including human life, begins at the moment of conception. That's what medical science is telling us today. They didn't tell us that 50 years ago when Roe versus Wade was brought into play. When did God become man? That morning in Bethlehem on Christmas? Or when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and she conceived? That is when God became man. Not nine months later. Not after a nice, long, rocky journey to Bethlehem. That is when it took place. And if God can become man at the moment of conception, your life became a life at the moment of your conception. And the knitting process isn't, isn't new. We've known this for centuries, eons, millennia. I love the 139th Psalm. Listen to what this says, verses 13 to 16. For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb, and I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Now you understand the fact that what I said is God always wanted one of you, never had one of you, and there you are. Personally, Tim, I don't know. But hey, the rest of you. <laughs> so let me ask you another question. Here's a tough one. How did we get to this place? How did we get to this place that we're at today where lives are simply being removed everywhere from the, from the womb to Walmart? How, how did this happen? Let me put it another way. Have you ever, have you ever wondered what possibly could have, what moves upon a people to, to, literally eliminate millions with such cruel detachment. Whatever, whatever brought any civilized people, a whole generation, to commit such a monstrous evil as the Holocaust? How did they ever get to that place? Well, history tells us that they redefined the value of life. They changed their attitude toward life. Selectively, of course, not all life, just some life. They basically saw the Jews as people who were not worthy to live because they were infecting and affecting the social strata. And we like to say, oh, we'd never do that. But we have done that. Our history is filled with those kind of things. In fact, just happened in Walmart, <laughs> sadly. 
Well, how did they do that? Why, what, what brought them to that conclusion? Why is it in the late 30s and early 40s that the Jews would be gathered up and simply eliminated? I can tell you one thing. And it's something that we all have, and many of you have dealt with it before you got here. You're going to deal with it after you leave here. One thing will always, always be ever-present in our minds and hearts today. The media. The media. It was the media that informed Germany that those who were Jewish of, in their life, in their country, was living in a way that was destroying who they were as a people. And they were less than people. They were like rats. So you can go ahead and remove them. The media. Ladies and gentlemen, we are what we hear. And more times than not, what we accept is what we hear. Joseph Goebbels was the minister of propaganda for Adolf Hitler. He was the one that put this all out. And he has a quote that you may know. And this is it. And this is the quote. If you tell a lie big enough and continue to say it often enough, people will believe it. You with me? If enough people say, well, I had somebody just the other day <clears throat> tell me in a conversation, they said something totally erroneous that had, had no biblical basis. And I said, "How? where did you get that? Well, I know all these people that say that. Oh, there's enough of them. Well, it must be true then. It doesn't matter if the entire nation says something. Truth is truth, and that's why you need to seek truth and not simply listen to something that somebody else tells you. Listen to this. Eventually, the unthinkable will become tolerable. The unthinkable will become tolerable. And what is tolerable will soon become acceptable. And what is acceptable, we will then make it legal. And if it's legal, we're going to praise it. But it has to start somewhere. And it starts with the erosion and the dismantling of truth. The core issue that we have, ladies and gentlemen, is not abortion. That's a medical procedure. It's not gas chambers back and during the war either, because that's, that's just simply a, medical devi or a mechanical device. No, the issue we have today is the value of life and when it begins and how important is it. Is it valuable enough to exist? Who has the right to live and who doesn't? That is the honest question. And you cannot ignore that question and just simply move right on into the medical issue. Well, it's just a procedure. No, it's a life. Who has the right to it and who doesn't? What if I came down here and we did this and I walked around and said, oh, um, you and uh, you know, Lonnie, uh, oh yeah, Lonnie's out. Uh, anybody I point to, uh, if the ushers could go ahead and take an AK and take care of business for me, I'd appreciate it. Take them out back. We don't want the noise. Uh, you would think, that's absurd. How is it that they came to that place? They simply came to believe that life had a certain level of expectation to exist, and that expectation rested with us. It doesn't rest with us. It rests with God, and God chose to give it to us. The scale, by the way, you need to know this, the scale that we're talking about, that you, you make that judgment about abortion, is the same scale that you use for homicide and suicide and infant... Uh, uh, genocide, euthanasia, ethnic cleansing. These are all things that that same scale rests upon. When you realize that a particular individual that walks this earth is not of value to live, then you become God. And you know what? He don't share the throne. When life is not valued, it's expendable. It's got to be valued. And let, let's, not, let's not lose sight of our responsibility to both parties involved in this tragedy. You with me here? I don't profess to have any experience personally. I don't. But I will tell you as a pastor of nearly 35 years, I have spent my good fair share of tearful days and sleepless nights with those who had to struggle both with 
the thought of making that choice or those who had already made it. We have this idea that somehow the freedom that a woman, a woman has the right to have a free choice of what they're going to do, takes into consideration or at least the thought that they have been well informed about everything that's going to take place and they are not unduly influenced. I have not seen that in my life. I'm not saying that there aren't. I've not seen it. Because rarely have I seen anyone who is clearly and deeply informed as to the ramifications emotionally and physically of what an abortion might do to them. Nor have I met anyone who didn't have some influence by, a, by friends or family or boyfriends or, or employers or husbands or, or counselors, many of whom did care less about her. They were just looking out for their own interests. We have to love these people. We don't have a choice to love those who find themselves in this struggle, either post or present. It is not an option for us. We must embrace and love and care for them. I found that God always brings some witness to me. He'll tell me either I'm going the wrong direction or the right one. And like I said, I've been dealing with this for a couple of months. A couple of weeks back, I was contacted by a woman that I had not seen or spoken to for well over 20 years. She told me about a book called, have you ever heard of it? I did. I just hadn't gotten one. Called Choose Zoe. You ever hear that? No? It's a bestseller. It has forwards and from uh, Jim Daly, president of Focus on the Family. Joel Godsey, the uh, president of Heartfelt International. And Pope Francis. Book's got some juice. And it talks about everything from abortion to adoption to parenting, drug abuse, healing from abuse. I mean, it, and it, gives you, it, it gives you resources as well. It's a wonderful book. Well, she was telling me about the book. And she tells me, she said, by the way, I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate that you were a part of my life. See, I must have stood in front of the door somewhere for her. And she said, I, I, I want you to know, Pastor, that when I came into, my off, into your office, things changed for me. And I remember it now. She, it was almost 30 years ago. She came into my office. She was pregnant. She wasn't married. She came in to tell me she had to leave the church because of this. She was taking care of our children in the nursery, but she couldn't do that anymore because of this. And she was heartbroken, and she was obviously being influenced to take action, if you know what I mean. We prayed. We cried. We talked. She made a whole fresh commitment of her life to Christ. And the result was a beautiful little girl by the name of Jazzy. Isn't that cool? Now, I hadn't heard from her for over 20 years. She, and she calls me, well, I'm about ready to do this message. Well, wait, you haven't heard the best part. Jazzy is now 27 years old. And Jazzy is the organizer of Pro-Life San Francisco. Is that cool? Wait a minute. There's more. She works out of her church, the Father's House, San Francisco. No kidding. This is true. Laura told me how much she appreciated the moments that we spent together and how, how God moved upon her life. That wasn't me. I had nothing to do with this. You know what, exactly what I'm talking about. I just got to stand in front of the door while God took care of business, right? Laura said, I want you to know I, I, I really appreciate everything that you did, who you are, what you've done for me, of course, she recognizes who really did it. And she said, I'd like to send you a copy of my book. That little girl that was in my office 30 years ago 
wrote a bestseller about those days in her life. I have 10 of these. And I don't want you to go home unhanded, so I'm going to tell you, you can buy this book anywhere. Barnes and Noble, Amazon, anywhere. They run about 500 apiece. <laughs> I'll go ahead and order them for you. No, the truth is, I have 10 of these, and I want to give them to you. But I have four, reason, four things I want you to do. One, only one to a family. Two, I want you to give a donation to Choose Zoe because she has a ministry. She's a, get, she's a speaker. She's an author. She, has, she does conventions. She takes care of children. Her ministry takes care of teen, pregnant teens and post-aborted pregnant or post-aborted teens. Yeah, I think I said that right. I would like you to make, give a donation. I would like you to give a nice one. And I will give you a book. If you come to that table and say, I don't have any money, but I really need that book, I will still give you this book. But I want to support that ministry. Because God sent her into my life so that you would hear about her, about this, and so that I could talk to you about what I had to share with you today. Isn't God amazing? He just never ceases to amaze me. He is so good at the God thing, I'm telling you. I have to wake up every day and say, okay, Ben, not your turn. <laughs> In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief comes to only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You know what the term life is in the Greek? Zoe. See, that isn't the name of this little child. That's, that means choose life. We're going to close differently this morning. We're not going to have the worship team come up. We're just going to have a little music, something just to be quiet. When I release you this morning, I'm going to ask you to leave quietly. But before you leave, before you rush out to get lunch and beat the Baptist to the restroom, <laughs> before you leave this place, I ask you this. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come and stand before you. And I'm going to ask you to take a moment. I'll have you come up in just a moment, prayer team. But I'm going to ask you to take a moment to step out of your seats and do something outside the norm. Be diverted from your path out that door. And take someone's hand, maybe several hands, any of these prayer warriors, and pray for those who in this last hour and 20 minutes, 240 lives will not impact this world. That's how many are lost in an hour and 20 minutes every single day, seven days a week. And I'm going to ask you to stand in the gap and bombard heaven that we might have a voice to make a change in small, innocent life that is going to grow up and make a difference. Will you do that for me? Now, you can rush out the door if you want. Nobody's going to lock the door as much as I would like to. But I am asking you to take a moment and step out of your own comfort zone and stand up for God. Now, right now, right now, somebody here has battled the issues we talked about. Maybe you're battling it with a decision to make. I want you to know the scripture is clear. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. You have no cause, no reason to allow your heart to be condemned because God condemns no one. If there is a conviction, that's not condemnation. That's a sign along the path that says time to make a change. Maybe you're here and you've never given your heart to the Lord. And I want you to know he, he knocks at the door of your heart and he's waiting for you to come in. And all I'm doing is standing between you and the door. So I'm going to share the opportunity for you to walk through that door and then open the door to him into your life. There is no greater thing you can possibly do than to give your life to Christ. How many here would raise your hand and say, I know Jesus and he's the Lord of my life.
Okay, leave your hands up for a moment. If that's not you, look around. You're not alone. Thank you. You're not alone. Every head, if you would just bow for a moment. Because we're not here to embarrass anyone or make you feel strange in any way. But I'm going to ask you, if, if you've not given your heart to Christ, would, would you just lift your hand and, and look, catch me with your eye? I just want to, I just want to pray with you. Anyone at all? You have not, and you know, or maybe you have, but you know, I keep, I keep second stepping. I keep walking right back out into the same old world, and I, I want that power to be able to stand on what's right and what's true. Yes. Yes, I see your hand. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. 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 Let's all pray this prayer together. And, and, and don't, don't just follow me. If you feel led, make your own. But let's communicate with God together. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me. Help me, Lord God, to forgive myself. Open my mind and fill me with truth. Set me free, Lord. For I believe that you died for me. You rose again for me. I will follow you, Lord, as you lead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would our prayer team come? And would you stand with me for a moment? As we prepare to go out into the world around us, I'm going to ask you to be prepared because I'm going to pray over you right now and then I'm going to let you go. But I'm going to ask you to come before you go. I want you to come here before you go. I want you to stand in the gap for innocent life. But I want you to know I'm going to pray for you and this is what I'm going to pray. I'll just pray. You'll hear it then. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask that your Holy Spirit go with each and every person that stands in this room at this moment, that as they go outside into the mission field that's outside these doors, that you will bring someone into their life, someone that will have to change their path because of their existence, someone, Lord God, that needs to hear your truth, that needs to know your grace and to feel your love, someone, Lord, who is broken, someone, Lord, who has a decision that is it's just so large in their life, they just don't know what to do with it. I'm asking you, Father God, that these soldiers of life that stand before me this morning, as they go out, Lord God, bring the battle to them and let them fight rightly. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. You are dismissed. God have mercy upon all those that are going to walk into your path and you're going to get them. Have a good time. God bless you.